presenting us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. It's always good to be here. Very much nicer to be here than it was last week. We are still working on things. Technology sometimes baffles us, and I swear that there were evil spirits in our air conditioning controls last week. And so that was a bit interesting. But for those who believe that sweating is good for the soul because it got all those things out, well, that's what we had last week. But it's very pleasant this week, which is great to be once again in a cooler environment. Once again, we're very pleased to have Kathy um, playing for us. Um, Casey is off on vacation during this month, and we are fortunate to have a gifted person who will be playing our hymns along with us. So, as we look in here, let's see what our announcements are today. Of course, everybody remembers that there's an exciting board meeting, and this one is really like an everybody meeting, um, at least at the beginning part of it. Um, during my pastor's report, we're going to be talking about priorities for the church. And I have invited, if you were here last week, everyone to come and share what they think are the number one, two, three priorities and to choose that top one. And if you'd like to come, and you're welcome to come to the beginning of the meeting and then when it gets to the reports and all, just leave. Not board members, but non-board members. Everyone is welcome to attend. Notice our Hot Meals ministry and our other activities that are coming up, including the Maranatha group on the 21st. And with that, I see that Karen is our elder. Let us proceed with worship. Will you stand and join me for the call to worship? Lord, in the best of times, in the worst of times, we know you are always there for us. And having you by our side gives us strength, encouragement, and assurance. From the beginning of the day till the end, from the first day of the year to the last, there is never a time when we are alone. So together we go forth into the world, living our lives as you would have us do, bringing, bringing the, the light, light of the, of world, the world to, to all, all who live and battle, battle the darkness. darkness. of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us be joined together in prayer. Dear Lord, as we come together this day, we ask for your presence to fill each and every one of us. During the week, it seems to drain from us. It seems to be taken up by all the demands in our world, in our lives. 
And now we need a time to come to recharge in the faith, to plug ourselves into you, to be able to re-energize for the week that is ahead. Lord, there are so many things in our life that just demand from us and we need to be able to respond to those needs because we realize that we are your representatives upon earth, your helping hands, your caring heart. And so this day, as we listen to the sermon, as we hear the scriptures, as we sing the songs, as we join in fellowship, Lord, let us be renewed to the max and be prepared for the week that is to come. Amen. people are here. I heard them today, uh, but they are not in sanctuary, and so hopefully we will be able to enjoy them later. There is nothing like that wonderful, well, I guess if you hear it every day all the time, Becky, maybe that cute little call of Leilani's gets a little tiresome, but you know, but to be able to hear and to be able to hear her call and know that she and Jay are here it is a joy for us on Sundays. So let's move on from our youth moment and go on to our times of prayer. The prayer lists seem to grow more and more each day this week. And I have to admit your pastor and his wife are both in need of prayer as we go through. Um, Susan had a household accident a couple weeks ago and too long to explain what happened. But you know what her ribs are like? She has four cracked ribs. And so if you see her moving slowly, um, she is just doing things very carefully. And so we want to pray for her healing. Recent doctor tests have also shown that some levels are out of whack that suddenly are now being put back. And in time, everything will be well. But we all know what it's like waiting in time for things to happen. Um, your pastor has an assortment of small, annoying things and important health um, doctor appointment tomorrow. So your prayers about 3.40 tomorrow afternoon would be appreciated. Uh, plus that annoying things like that tire that's now low. Nothing like driving in from Rancho with a tire you know, sign that says, oops. So. Now let's go back and forth between good things and others. We had a message from Mary Willihan. Did you, you talk, Kathy talked to Mary. It was good to hear that both Mary Willihan and Tim who live in Hemet were safe from the fire, that the areas of the city that they lived in were not the ones impacted except for the, you know, the dismal look like you're in the Lord of the Rings movie with the dark gray clouds hanging over and the heavy breathing and things like that. Um, but Mary reported that she and Tim were both fine and safe and were not being directly affected. And so that was really good to hear. Um, also good to hear was the message I got from Joe last night um, that Judy is continuing to recover well, um, that she has gone through what we hope is the last of the procedures and is gaining strength every day. And we hope to see them back in their usual place up here on the left side front um, as soon as possible. And so that was great news to hear that her recovery is going just like it should. Among our concerns we have right now, and this is a difficult thing because Susan and I have just gone through this experience with the loss of our nephew. Right now a memorial service is being conducted for the son of Lori Klein. Um, you'll remember that he passed away just a couple weeks ago unexpectedly. It's been very, very hard on them and that memorial service is going on at this point. So we want to be able to send our thoughts to them and to their extended family and his great number of friends um, in his passing. He was only in his 40s, I believe. So that was definitely a concern. Now, what about the rest of you? Are there other things that we need to hear? Do we have a report on Zephaniah? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. So, so he is home from the hospital, and this is going to be an ongoing concern until he gets of an age and they can do all that they need to take care of these. So we want to deal with that. Any other concerns that we're going to lift up or joys? If not, let's be shared in a time of personal prayer. Dear Lord, we know there are people with major concerns. So much of our state is aflame. And we know that while naturally speaking, a forest fire can be good when it affects the lives of people and often the firefighters themselves, those are heavy concerns for us. And for all of those people who have been dealing with natural things, whether it's the effect of the storm that came so close to us or whether it's the fires that are burning, we want to pray for that situation. Lord, we cannot imagine what it is like to lose a child and to have someone pass away so unexpectedly. And we want to offer up our prayers for Lori and John Klein and all their friends and family members. What a difficult thing it is to say goodbye to a loved one. And we ask that they just embrace the message of the gospel, which is that there is a life hereafter and that he has been welcomed into that eternal life where one day we will all be together. But for those who remain, we ask for our prayers. We are excited when we hear good news, Lord, about things happening, a young baby coming home from the hospital, people being safe from the fire, people recovering from surgeries. And Lord, we have to remember that we want to lift up the good things that are happening in our life, where at the same time we are concerned about those annoying, bothersome things that happen in our lives that disrupt everything and cause so many problems and discomfort. So Lord, it is a mishmash this day that we lift up, joy and praise for what happens and concern for others. But Lord, we know that as our loving Father, you want to hear both, and we thank you for listening. Amen. join together in the prayer that Jesus taught for all his followers to recite. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning, scripture is from the book of Luke, chapter 14, verses 7 to 11. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down in the place of honor. In case someone more distinguished than you comes and has been invited by your host, and the host who invited the more distinguished person has to come to you and say, give this person your place, and then in disgrace, you would start to take a lower place. But when you're invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, and then you will have been honored in the presence of all who sit at the uh, table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading. The 
Jesus was at it again. And once more, the Pharisees, those leaders of the Jewish faith, those keepers of the law, those proclaimers of the way in which the law should be observed, were not happy. I especially like the look on their faces. It's just like, you have got to be kidding. Isn't that great there? They were unhappy. They were upset. They were dismayed, agitated, troubled, and disturbed. Along with most other words of similar meaning and intent that you could think of. And I have to admit, it was understandable that they felt this way. For after all, who likes to be, to use an expression of old, called on the carpet? <coughs> How many remember that one? Called on the carpet. In front of the very people that you were supposed to be the religious role models for. That you were supposed to be their guide, their director, their teacher, their rabbi and to have it pointed out directly in front of them all of your faults, all of your shortcomings in relation to the faith that you preached. On this day and occasion, and it was happening more and more, you were dressed down, you were called out, they were bawled out, they were taken to task. And to have it done repeatedly by this new young upstart to the faith, this Jesus of Nazareth made it even harder. But that's exactly what was happening and seemed to be occurring on a more and more regular basis. For when Jesus needed someone to compare to, and I always use the right and the left side, maybe I'll switch and put the good side over here next time, pointing out on one side the good and righteous people and what they do, and then on the other, pointing to the Pharisees as an example of just the opposite. For you see, essentially what Jesus was doing in many of his talks and his speeches and sermons was teaching you and I, people of the past, people of the present, people yet to come, how we should act, how we should respond, how we should act especially in regards to all those around us. How many remember that campaign a few years ago, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And the emphasis that before we open our mouth and get ourselves in trouble, that we would take time to just run through an answer of that. And so Jesus would say, this is what I need you to do if you want to call yourselves children of God, which is certainly a title I would like to have, and to follow in the footsteps that the Lord would have us do. Now at this point, you might be interested in just what it was the Pharisees were doing that earned the ire of Jesus, and what it was they did or didn't do to become the object of his scorn. And what it is they did that was wrong, you might ask, Actually, it would probably be easier to answer the question, what didn't they do wrong? This is a picture of the famous Pharisee and the publican, where, Lord, I thank you that I am so great and not like this man over here. In Matthew 23, we hear these words of Jesus. And Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. Notice they tell you. After all, they are in charge. They're your religious leaders. But listen to this phrase. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Uh, how many have heard that one? But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up, Jesus said, heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. And then he goes on to say, everything they do is for the people to see about just how great and holy they really are.
They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. And they love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. Further on in the chapter, it goes on to say, as Jesus speaks to them directly, and this is an important part that we'll come back to later in the sermon, he says to them, and he, I have to eye somebody, you know, who gets to be the evil Pharisees. Oh, there's two of them right over there. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. You have neglected justice. You have neglected mercy. You have neglected faith. And these you ought to have done without neglecting the others. And then Jesus finishes up with this epitaph, which speaks about just how severe he believed the situation was. He says, you blind guides, straining out a gnat, and swallowing a camel. <laughs> How about that one? Okay. And that's just part of the list of what Jesus saw the Pharisees doing wrong. We could go on with more and more. But it's of greater importance now, rather than hearing about what others did wrong, to hear what we should be doing right. For us to hear what Jesus wants us to do, he calls upon us to do, Pharaoh, I've got a job for you. He encourages us to do, Kathy, I just need you to step forward so that we might truly make a difference, so that Susan might have an impact, that Lolly might make a life-changing impact, that Jeff might make an impact on all the people that we encounter each and every day of our lives. Now, once again, as is often the case in my sermons, we don't need to listen to my words or thoughts on this topic, but rather we have the one spoken by Jesus himself of what we must do and the manner in which we must do it. And just what that might be is told to us by Jesus, but in doing so this time, he's going to quote from the Old Testament, which he often did. And this time he quoted from the book of Micah. Tell me, how many people could find the book of Micah without looking at the table of contents? I couldn't. I had to turn to the front to be able to find it. And there's a scripture passage where we are told that while offerings we are, let's see, a scripture passage where we are told that while the offerings we make are good and they're important and they're needed, and please don't stop writing checks to the church or I will get in trouble with my financial people, there is something more that God wants from us. So listen to the words of the prophet Micah. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? No. With the Lord, will he be pleased with thousands of rams? With ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Here's your chance to get rid of that one you never really liked. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not a firstborn, by the way. So, but the prophet Micah goes on to say, He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice? and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Here's what we are to do. We're to do justice. We're to love kindness. We are to walk humbly with God, indicating for one and all to hear that it is more important what you do in relation to others than what you give. That's the bottom line, isn't it? of the scripture passage read for us earlier from Luke 14, the portion where Jesus was talking about the proper way to do a banquet or a dinner or an eating event, and where he tells us in this particular instance not to invite those whom we know will in turn invite us to their home, so that it becomes a tit-for-tat type of event. I invite Kathy, Kathy invites me, we get two meals, we love it. No. 
It's not a you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Today we eat at my house, tomorrow we eat at yours. I always want to eat at Lolly's house. Ernie is such a great cook. Something that I will do as I know I will get a return for my investment. But Jesus points out that the greater good comes from, the greater reward will become ours, not here, but in heaven. Sort of like a great retirement account, right? Sort of like an investment in our future. If we do something for others, expecting little, if anything, in return, doing it out of the generosity of our hearts, not because we have to, knowing that they are in need, recognizing that they need it the most, and will most likely never be able to return it in kind, we do it because that's where the blessings are in our lives. And perhaps with the knowledge as we look at those we are helping that there but for the grace of God go I. In a similar train of thought, you know what came to mind as I wrote this part of the sermon? The expression, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Not, not, not that I don't like gifts. My, my Christmas list will be out soon for one and all to have. Recognitions, appreciations, acknowledgements, praise. Yes, I am human. And those things all feel good to have someone notice what it is you're doing. When you've made a really good dinner, it's nice to have someone say something nice about it. When you make special things and bake them and to have people make a fuss over them. When you have a new hair, well, some of us have haircuts and clothes. When you recognize that you have gone over and above and done so much more than is asked and someone recognizes those are good things. But I also need to make sure, and I'm still working on this, as do we all, because God isn't finished with me yet, that humility is part of who I am and the things I do and the same things with we do. And that is something that Jesus was trying to get across to the Pharisees. For in terms of humility and humbleness, they had none of it. That's why we hear this passage from Matthew chapter 6. Beware of practicing your piety before men in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. That passage makes me feel very good inside about the life I lead, the life I try to lead, and the things I do and why I do them. Knowing that if no one at all ever notices what I do and how and why I do it, that God sees it all, embraces you for it one day when you come to him. And he's waiting someday to thank you, to reward you for doing so. And that should be the greatest motivation we ever have for doing good. And that is what Jesus was trying to teach the Pharisees, what he's trying to teach us. Two very important lessons. The first of all is the great feeling that comes to us from doing for others especially when they cannot return that. Just that wonderful feeling when you have made a difference in some way in their lives, that you have lifted them up, that you have helped them, you have encouraged them, you have aided them, you have taken what you have and shared with them. And when you see the response on their face and know the response in their heart, isn't that a great thing to do? And then secondly, we must remember that our rewards at times will come to all of us. At times it would seem like we do far more than our share. At times we might ask, wouldn't it be nice if others were helping with us? At times we wonder if there's too much for us to do. But recognize the fact that each time we do something, we make a difference and make a beginning of a transformation for others. We never have a full idea of how much impact we have on them when we present that. In my lion world, we call it the lion experience. It's when you fully became a lion. Everyone has a day when they are formally installed in our club. One of the governors or past district governors comes. They put through a seminary, they, a seminary, a ceremony. They talk about various things and you officially become a lion. 
But the day when you really come is when you have that aha experience. When you're at one of our vision screenings and you see a 12 year old child come through who has never had an eye test and never had glasses. And our doctors test them and they find their prescription and they find the glasses and they put it onto the child and he or she looks at the world as he has never seen it before. And it's like, my gosh, there's a world out there. For those of us who wear glasses, remember, it's the difference between now what the world looks like and what it does. And there are so many different things and every lion can tell you this is the experience that I had that made such a difference. I remember Governor John who followed me talking about delivering food to the hungry when he was up in the Bay Area. A basket of food, a ham, and individual presents for each of the children. And going to a house where when they walk in there is a mother and four children and the mother says, look, we're going to have Christmas dinner after all. And the kids grabbing each of their presents and putting them under the tree because it was the only presents they were going to give. And actually feeling like maybe they should reach in their pockets and find something more because the mother is going through the basket and she's saying, and there's yams and there's rolls and there's a pie and there's tears running down her face. And he goes, that's when I knew I was a lion. In our Christian faith, we have similar things where we have made a difference. Sometimes we see the immediate effects. Other times they will find you later on in your life, or it may not be until we get to heaven, where somebody comes up to you and says, you do not know, Jeff Bruno, how much you meant to me, Becky Yoakum. You do not know what your actions did for me, but you were there when I needed you the most, and I am thankful for it. So our sermon today is about the fact that yes, we will take all the giving that you have, all the financial means that help keep this church going. But what we love more is within this church and in your lives, you're doing for others in any way you can. What a difference it makes in their life when you humbly think of others first before yourself. Amen. I know at times pastors go over the same points over and over again, and you've heard them all. We should say like pastor sermon at number four, you know, and just everybody just nods or something like that. Talk about the commitment that we get from people and what it's like when others come to us for the first time. Once again, analogy from my Lions Club, we have a new young member who is so excited she cannot do enough. In fact, she's like a young puppy, shall we say, almost. I mean, that's the energy level that she has. And her name is Stephanie and she is just wonderful. And for those of us who are here forever, I love that spirit. And I'd love to think about the fact that there might be others who come who have found us anew, found this chance to serve and be a difference. And hopefully we're always out on the lookout for somebody who may be on, and the expression is, on the edge of darkness, and that if we take their hand and lead them to the light, what a difference we can make. Could be one of the greatest things we ever do for them. With that in mind, let's sing our hymn of invitation and dedication, I have decided to follow Jesus.
Let's talk about giving and sharing. You may have heard me talk about the fact that our son and his family live in Viroqua, Wisconsin, population 4,500, and it's the county seat. Yes, it is. Um, they have a Walmart, um, they have a McDonald's, and a, um, a, a frozen yogurt place, and a Culver's, and that's about it. But what they've got is community. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody interacts with everyone. They teach at a special school in the Waldorf system, and it's hard as grandparents to buy anything because the kids, our boys, four and five, have everything. Because as soon as your boys get too big for something, they pass it down to someone else. As soon as your children no longer play with this toy because it's too young, they pass it on to someone else. As soon as your kids outgrow these certain things, they pass it on to someone else. And you walk and you look around and go, my gosh, it's sort of like having 22 grandparents and all. But it's what they do. How can we help? As teachers in this school system, it's a private school system, at the end of the year, the parents and the children of the class get together and do a project for the teachers to say thank you for the year. One year, they built raised flower beds, gardening beds for my daughter-in-law. And they did that just because they wanted to say, you have had a life-changing experience on my children. May this be a life-changing experience for you. It is such a great place to see. It definitely, it is better to give than to receive. These people seem to live that and it brings joy in their life. So think about what you can give. Think about what you can do. There are so many things that will make the difference in the life of someone else. Loving God, in humility we come before you with gratitude for our many blessings. We ask your blessing now on each gift and each person represented. We ask your guidance and your wisdom as we here at Orangethorpe continue to find ways to share our gifts to bring light and hope to others so that they may feel your presence and love in their lives. Use us in your service in the week that lies ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
think Jesus recognized that people forget. How many people forget things if you don't write it down like immediately and that it happens all the time? And we just kind of shake our head. We try telling the other one, remind me when we get home, and then we both forget. It's just kind of the way it is. And as hard for us to believe, Jesus knew there would come a time, a year, two years, three years, five, twenty, when the next generation came or the generation after, when people would forget about what happened during that time, what happened at the false court, what happened on the cross, what happened in the resurrection. And so he said, I'm going to come up with this way um, where we're going to take this bread. It's going to represent my body and that I have given it for you. It's been broken for you. And then I'm going to take this juice and it's my blood spilled for you because I gave you so much while I was here. And then I gave you my life so that you might have everlasting life. And by doing this, maybe we will remember and never forget that's what I did. And that's what we are thinking about at communion. Elder? Let us pray. Loving God, we come to your table with praise and thanksgiving for the invitation and the freedom to gather, gather here each week with our family and friends. We give thanks for the gift of your son, Jesus, and that great sacrifice he made that we could all be redeemed. We ask a special blessing on the bread and the cup as we share together. May our hearts and minds be open to the leading of your Holy Spirit as we rededicate ourselves this day. We ask that you use us as instruments of your love and your peace in our daily lives. Amen. Shall we now partake? Bring his peace to you in each and every day of your life, helping you over every hurdle, every stumbling block, every difficult part in your life, and to lead you along the paths that he would have you lead. Amen.